I'm Dr. Ben Newman. I study coronaviruses for a living. Uh, let's try to answer some of your questions. The next question is from Craig, who we know. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. All right. Um, and Craig is asking uh, about the complication of loss of smell or taste or having less sense of smell or taste, um, which is pretty common with uh, COVID-19. Now, I was looking through some of the studies on this. Some of the early studies um, were just picking it up in maybe 5% of cases. Uh, some of the later studies, and by later I mean like March, yeah, <laughs> they were done, uh, seemed to be picking up, picking that same symptom up in as many as 80% of cases. And it may be one of those things that doesn't necessarily jump out at you if you're having breathing difficulty you're not going to go to hospital because, you know, your taste, your food tastes a little bit funny. Like the other symptoms can be uh, maybe more alarming and uh, seem more serious. And so I think it's probably something that's um, been undercounted. But uh, also, I think uh, part of the difference in numbers is going to come from the way that people are being tested. If you were, for example, doing fecal testing, which is the most accurate uh, way of uh, testing that we have right now, that would give you a different population. Like the normal test is testing for infection literally at the site where you're, um, uh, where you detect smell and the, uh, like the top wall of your nostrils, um, kind of a little bit far up in there. That's why they need that sort of long Q-tip to get up to that area. And so people who are positive for coronavirus at that site, by that nose swab test, which is the one that's commonly done, will pretty likely have infection in those cells. And infection in those cells looks like, or uh, smells like, or maybe doesn't smell like, uh, a loss of smell or taste, uh, either partial or total. So the most widely cited study, which looks pretty good to me and was put together in March and published in April, is called, if you want to look this up, yeah, I will read it off the screen for you, um, Olfactory and Gustatory Dysfunctions as a Clinical Presentation of Mild to Moderate Forms of the Coronavirus Disease, COVID-19, a multi-center European study. And it's got a lot of people in it, and it looks like a fairly well done study. And they looked at not only the time when they report the um, uh, loss of smell, olfactory symptoms, um, but also at the time it takes for them to resolve. And so, here we go. So of the people that noticed it, whether it was a small or large uh, loss of smell, they don't seem to have dealt with that data separately. They put it all together. And so you've got some people that will actually resolve and get uh, what they think is their full smell back um, within a four-day period. They, they broke it up into four different windows. Of the people that they sampled, uh, something in excess of 95% had their um, taste back, or at least reported on a questionnaire that they had their taste and smell fully back within 14 days. Um, uh, the most common time was that they would be uh, um, have trouble smelling and tasting for about a week. Um, but there was that small portion, um, somewhere around 3%, if I am reading the charts correctly, that seem to have had a much longer tail. So uh, something greater than two weeks um, without smell. And so I think the thing that's probably gonna be underlying this is that if you've got infection in those cells, you're destroying two kinds of cells potentially. And there have been traces of virus found in both of these cells. So one is called your neuroepithelium. These are the cells that actually have the smell receptors, those uh, odorant receptors. In them, which are something that we cover in uh, bio two, no bio one, yeah. Stop by any time if you want to see them <laughs> in action. Um, and uh, so those can be infected, and if they were to die from the infection or from the immune response to infection, then the signal would not be coming in, and all the neurons that are behind would just be sitting there saying, you know, what's up? Uh, there's no more signal coming in. I guess I don't smell anything. Um, there is also, I have seen a report that the first layer of neurons, which are sitting right behind those uh, neuroepithelial cells, can potentially be infected. I haven't seen much evidence of infection further back into the brain, because th these neurons would connect up with the olfactory bulb, which is uh, it's a 
big part that sticks out in the mouse and a dog, but it's kind of small and weak in people. But it's going to be located at the sort of front bottom, if I remember my brain anatomy correctly, which, yeah, you could do better looking that up at a Wikipedia, just to be sure. And so this is good. If the coronavirus was a little bit better at climbing up neurons, then all of these cases where you get the uh, epithelium infected, there is a very direct path. You probably only have to go through two or three cells to be in, you know, the brain proper. Um, and at that point, yeah, any infection in there would probably look like either meningitis or encephalitis, both of which can be quite deadly. So this, this virus could be a lot worse if it was better at climbing up neurons. Um, but uh, at least thankfully so far, it doesn't seem to be. Will there be some change? Uh, just modifying a little part at random of one or two proteins can potentially make a virus that is a little bit better at climbing. And we know viruses like the polio virus, for example, or rabies virus are very good. They, it takes them some time, but they will eventually um, get to, uh, in the case of polio, the uh, spinal cord. And then, um, yeah, usually from the spinal cord, they can get into the brain. Um, so thankfully, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 isn't doing that yet. Uh, and so we don't need to break out uh, those giant wards of iron lungs and um, yeah, polish a bunch of gravestones just yet, which is a good thing. Yeah, I'm in favor of that, uh, the virus not doing those things. And so that's, um, that's the latest, that's where the science seems to be right now. I haven't found anything that is really meaningfully different uh, from this. It took us a while to recognize this as a symptom. And I think that's just because it's not a normal you know, one of the first things you think of with uh, flu-like illness symptoms. <laughs> and sometimes you also have a runny nose or uh, you can have a blocked nose with mucus, which can lead to this. But uh, they're very caref careful in this paper of excluding all the people that have definitely like a blocked nose or nose that's so swollen up that uh, there's really not much air passing through because that would diminish your sense of smell just because you're, you know, from purely mechanical reasons. Um, that would not necessarily indicate uh, destruction of tissue. Once the tissue is destroyed, you're probably going to have to wait on your resident stem cells coming into the area, figuring out what cell to divide into, dividing and repopulating all the areas where um, you've lost it, uh, smell. So some of the circuitry is going to be different on the other side. Will this result in the same sense of smell? Will it feel the same to a person? I think that's a uh, question for psychologists. You are repairing and replacing some of the parts of the circuit. And it's not just like electricity where it's going to just flow, flow, flow. There are connections. There is the strength of the signal. And um, yeah, a change in one of those things could potentially change the way you perceive taste or smell um, forever. And so, yeah. So far, there's not a lot of evidence that that's the case, um, but uh, yeah, that would be a thing that I would look out for, and it would probably be subtle, but uh, there may be uh, some subtle difference. Doesn't necessarily have to mean it's going to be worse. It could be better, yeah, but uh, yeah, who knows? So that'll be an interesting topic for future research. So thanks very much. This has been Ask Dr. Ben.